times in our lives when it seems like the burdens of our life seems to be exceedingly great. And our hopes and our dreams and our plans get shattered by unforeseen obstacles and circumstances that come across us. Just like what we were saying here, you know, two weeks ago, Joyce volunteered because we didn't have a backup for singing. She says, I'll come and sing. She's, and now she's in the hospital. You know, there's just, there's times where we experience unmet expectations. And, and they're not always physical calamities, but there's circumstances, there's relationship calamities, there's all kinds of things that happen. And disillusionment is something that we can struggle with over the circumstances which are beyond our control. We're human, right? So we, sometimes we struggle with disillusionment. Times where we question, God, what's going on here? We're tempted, if we're honest, right? We're tempted to doubt God's goodness. The Old Testament is filled with wonderful character sketches and stories, and, and each of these character sketches has important lessons to teach us about life, about human nature, about God, and our relationship to this world. And, and one of the main characters you, you're all familiar with because he wrote the book of Psalms is King David. And King David uh, was, was called by God as a man who was after his own heart. Now, when you look at the story of David, his life, his life was, was multifaceted. Um, he started out like as a humble shepherd boy in an agricultural family that made their living off the, the land in the, in the area surrounding Bethlehem. And, um, you know, David did, did good at his job, but, but God had something else in mind for him, Right? He started out in this place. And, but God had a calling on his life. Much the same way as God's got a calling on each of your lives. Because you're the body of Christ. And each of you has a part to play in the body of Christ. He's got a calling on you. Much the same as he had a calling on David. And a lot of the stories that we read about David are meant for us to learn from. So we can see how God relates to people. And other characters, I mean. So we see David, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he gets uh, this visit from uh, a prophet. And it, actually, he wasn't even part of the picture because his older brothers were bigger and stronger. And he was kind of the least of them. And he was out tending the sheep while the prophet came and talked to each of the boys. And the prophet's telling Jesse, the dad, you know, that one of these boys here is going to be the next king of Israel. Oh, man. Can you imagine? Is it me? David, he's not even in the picture. He's out in the field somewhere, you know, looking after sheep. And one by one, he goes through. Jesse, Jesse's sons, goes, uh, Samuel goes through. And then, no, there's, it's not any of these. Is there any more? Oh, yeah, little David, you know, he's out in the field there. Well, bring him in. Sure enough, God says, that's the one. That's the one. So he has this call in his heart. And the next thing you know it, we see him stepping onto the stage and we see his rise to, to fame. And, uh, you know, there's a battle going on between the Philistines and the Israelites. And we're in this valley and big Goliath, their champion, like this giant guy who was a mighty warrior for the Philistines, was challenging all the Israelites and they're all shaking in their boots. Nobody wanted to fight him because... The deal was if you lose, everyone in that country becomes the slave of the winner, right? That's pretty high stakes. Would you want to fight, even if you're like a big dude, right? And you're a good warrior. Would you want to fight this champion who, you know, he was monstrous and he had a history of being powerful. Would you want to fight him? You know, sometimes we criticize the other Israelites. And go, oh, how could they not? Well, in the flesh, man, you wouldn't want to tangle with Goliath. And not just that, you wouldn't want to have the entire nation and your family become slaves because you didn't quite meet the standard, right? But here's David, right? He comes in there and he, and we know the story. God empowers David 
And with the tools that he had on him, he slays this mighty warrior with a simple tool. And there's a sign in that, that God can take whatever he wants to take and do whatever he wants with it. And nothing on earth is going to get in the way of that. And in this case, it was David and a small stone from a sling that slew this mighty giant, this warrior. Now, so that's kind of the back drop, right? And so we, we see David, you know, oh, he's the hero, right? And he gets brought into Saul's palace and everything, and, and Saul is all happy at first until David gets put in charge of, you know, you know this guy. I mean, he's obviously got some skill or something. He's got something that we need, so let's, let's, let's get him into the army, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how he does. And well, every time he goes out, God gives him success. So he's just like, he can't do any wrong. Why? Not because he's such a great Goliath kind of guy, right? Because God is with him, and God has a plan. And nothing's going to get away in, God's, uh, of, in the way of God's plan. So you know, David rises to prominence, and he gains great victories for the armies of Israel. And, oh, man, this is great. And then people start singing his praises. <laughs> David has slain this many. Well, Saul has slain this many. Oh, Saul's like, wow. Yeah. That, that's, that, that's just not right. This guy's, this guy's you know, he's, he's going to take my kingdom if this keeps going on. So Saul began to hate David. And furthermore, Saul was disobedient to God. And the prophet Samuel told him, because you disobeyed me, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you and given to someone who's better than you. So Saul pitched his anger in his flesh against David, and he did everything he could to make David's life a living misery. Now, this is kind of the backdrop to what we're going to talk about. See, David, David was living on the run. He was going around hiding out because Saul was after him. Yeah, there were some of the people that he had as friends who he'd earned the trust of who were with him. But here we are in Psalm 86. And we hear David's cry. Now, when we have hard times, right, this is a template. What we're going to talk about today is a template to show us how God desires us to react when things don't quite go how we thought they should. Psalm 86, verses 1 to 3 to start. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call on you all day long. Man, you hear that? You hear, his, you hear his cry of his heart? This is not times of smooth sailing. God had a great call on David's life, but he's finding himself in the middle of storm clouds where the rain is pouring on him, so to speak. Or the sun is, I guess it would be more accurate to say, the sun was beating down on him to where it was scorching his skin. You know, it's an age-old question and among the most difficult to answer. We've all thought about it and we've tried to explain it and we've struggled with it. We all wonder exactly how God can be all loving and still allow such immense pain in our lives. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. And it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks around that keeps us from truly trusting in God with our whole heart. Yet in a strange way, the pain that we experience in our lives may be the best sign that he is truly good. And that through the pain, we come to learn to trust him more and give him more of who we are. 
And in the writing of this psalm, David was in this distressing circumstance. And these circumstances that were surrounding him were absolutely beyond his control. There's no controlling it. And he longed to serve God and he longed to do what's right. But despite doing what was right, his enemies were relentless. They were relentless and they pursued him. There was no rest for him. And David, remember, being a man after God's own heart, he understood the heart of God in all of it. He recognized that without God's help, that he would be trashed, he would be overcome, he'd be run over. And at the beginning of his prayer here in Psalm 86, David pleads, for help from God on the basis of his covenant relationship with him. His plea to guard his life was accompanied by a clause like, I am faithful to you, God. And now that wasn't a statement of his ego. It was just him acknowledging that, that he was the son of this covenant relationship. He was the son of Israel. And God's prophet had spoken over him. So he... He knew that there's a covenant relationship that God had made with him and that he belonged wholly to the Lord. He was not his own. He belonged to the Lord. And when we are encountering difficulties, my friends, like David, it's very good for us to recognize the covenant relationship that we have with God. Most of us here are not Israelites. Maybe you are a Jew and you have Israel in your blood, maybe. Most of us here are Gentiles, Gentile believers. But don't forget this. Even though you are not Israelites, you've been grafted in to the root of the patriarchs of Israel. God has grafted you in. And we are still the children of promise. So when God says something and he speaks to us, we can take that as a covenant promise through Jesus. This is a, actually a fulfillment of an ancient prophecy given to Isaiah. Centuries prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, right? When God prophetically decreed through Isaiah in Isaiah 52.10, he said, The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations, all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. That's been fulfilled through Jesus. And Jesus, when he was walking with his disciples, he said in John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in 1 Peter 2, 10, the apostle Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mer mercy. Friends, God is not far away, as some people suppose. When you believe in Jesus, as was said, you're the temple of the Spirit of God. He is actually as close as the mention of your name, of his name. And you are not alone, no matter what life throws at you. You are not alone. And David, David, his heart, he had a heart that longed to be close to God, a heart that chased after him. It didn't matter what came his way. He wanted nothing to get in the way of his pursuing this closeness with his God. This is the attitude that is pleasing to God. This is the heart after God, his own heart. This is the attitude that he's calling us as believers, to embrace. That's why this psalm is what it is. The message that God wants us to receive today is that the heart of David can also be our heart. The problem is, right? Well, I see that. Yeah, pastor, I see what you're saying. But the problem is that this world that we live in has a way of distracting us, doesn't it? Right? We get distracted I don't know about you, I'm a little bit ADHD. And sometimes, you know, the squirrel goes, and I'm like, oh, chasing the squirrel. 
oh, oh, yeah, then something else and something else. You know, I get distracted, some of us more easily than others, but distraction in the spirit takes our eyes off of God and gets our focus on the things of this world. And the world is filled with so many troubles. There's so many troubles and there's so many temptations out there. And the enemy of our soul, he attempts both to use the troubles of this world and the temptations of this world to sidetrack us from pursuing closeness with God. Troubles are distractions. The enemy tries to get us to focus on doubt, to doubt God's goodness, despite what we see in his word. Now look at David's perspective, right? From verse 4, David reads, Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations that you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Hear that. David, crying out to God, bearing his, his spirit before before God, and also before the people. Hear that. It's refreshing, isn't it? When you look at his perspective, it's refreshing. He's so honoring and revering of the Lord, despite what presently is happening in the world around him. And consider all the troubles he faced. He'd done good in Israel. God had blessed him, and, God, and Israel was flourishing under under his leadership, wherever he put his feet. He never did anything wrong. Yet here was Saul, jealous of him, trying to kill him constantly. And it, even if Saul wasn't after him, there are other enemies. The Philistines were after him. There are people after him on all sides. Now, when I was in Israel a couple of years back, we visited En Gedi, which is a spring where there's a cave in the mountain where Saul was trying to get David and his troops were trying to find him and they were hiding in the back of a cave in En Gedi. And I looked at this place, like for those of you who've never been there, if you look on, on the internet, you can see pictures of it. But the hills surrounding En Gedi. <laughs> wow. David wasn't just there like, you know, like this is my weekend of trial. Oh, my life is so hard. Oh, Monday morning comes around. Oh, I guess that's gone now. Uh, no. David was relentlessly being pursued in those hills. And I'm looking at these hills. The closest thing that I can actually bring it to illustration is to compare these hills. The only thing that I've seen in Canada that even comes close to this is that great big bald hill when you get to Cash Creek. And you can go to Kamloops or you can go to Ashcroft, that great big kind of wedge, bald hill in the middle. You start driving towards Ashcroft and you're looking at this hill. What a desolate hill. You know, I've often, I've been driving past there and I'm like, I wonder if actually anyone's actually ever walked up on that hill. Like even if I was a First Nations person, you know, a thousand years ago or whatever, and I'm walking along there, I, I'd stay off that hill. Like, well, I go up there. What is there, cacti and grass? No, I mean... Even the mountain sheep stay down near the river, you know. So you go up there, what is it? Rattlesnakes and cacti, right? Well, that, that's kind of like this place that, that Saul chased David into. That's what, in, that's what the hills country around En Gedi is kind of like that. Parched for water. Like they had to go to a spring to get their water. But not very much place to find food. Not very much place to find shelter. The sun would be beating down in your head. Imagine... You know, you see the dust in the distance as Saul's soldiers are, are pursuing you. And, oh, no. Just as I stop, now i got to leave. And he's running. I mean, there's stories about this in the Old Testament, right? Where David's running around this side of the rock and Saul's on that side of the rock. And the cat and mouse game, you know. 
easy for us to read. It's kind of entertaining, but it's not entertaining if you're living it. You know? <laughs> so, wouldn't you be tempted to be bitter? I mean, if I was David in my flesh and I was in this Cash Creek wilderness or in Getty wilderness, right? And I was up there for a couple months or a couple years and not able to leave and I'm depending on people smuggling food into me and all that kind of stuff. If I was there and I'm like, God, you commissioned me. You promised that I was going to be the king of Israel. <laughs> See how easy it would be to, to let your mind wander to temptation? Well, God, are you good? God, are you good? Doesn't look like it. There's not a whole lot of good happening around me in my life right now. So, if you're good, then what, why don't you do what you can do and get me out of this so I don't have to suffer anymore? Why do I have to suffer like this? Is this what a son of promise must endure? If you're there, what's wrong with you, God? Why, why aren't you hearing me? Don't you have enough power to overcome these enemies of mine? If you do, then why don't you do it, God? Why can't you just wave your hand and change everything? And if you don't, well, I'm going to be angry with you. You see where I'm going with this? You can see how easy it would be to get bitter and angry with the life that God has placed you in at that time and to lose sight of God's purposes, to drift away. But that's not what we see here in Psalm 86, is it? That's not what we see. When we read that refreshing passage that we just went through, that's not what we see. David could have looked at the trouble that he was going through and have just been angry and bitter and grumbling. But his heart was after God. So he looked at God. He's like, God, have mercy. I can't do anything. But I know that you are good. Even though I can't see what's going on right now, I trust you, God. I place my trust in you. David asked for mercy because he was completely dependent on God. He cried all to, to God all day long because he could not or would not rely on anyone else for his help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Where does my help come from? It's another, another scripture, right? David cried out because he knew that the circumstance was impossible and it was painful. But he trusted that God would be with him through this and that he would hear his heart's cry. Now, David had enemies, right? Enemies all over the place. And some of them had human faces. Some of them had human faces. Now, David might not even have seen what's behind the scene. He could see the, the people pursuing him. But the true enemy of David, for, and for that matter, the true enemy of every person sitting in this room here is none other than Satan and his fall, horde of fallen angels, whose, whose mission is to steal, to kill, and destroy, because they hate people. All the other enemies that are around them that affect us, affected David, are pawns. Remember? Saul Saul would go berserk because evil presence would an evil presence would rest on him. Through human sinners, Satan was trying his best to dissuade David from trusting in, in his God. They were trying to cause him to lose faith in the goodness of God, and to bring destruction upon um, David through the painful distractions he was experiencing. And I, I'm going to interrupt this thought here just to say something else. There's a side note here, and I think it's really important for us to understand that Satan is a master of distraction. And he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a master of the sure, the the, the the fake, making it look like it's the real. Yeah. I think 
it's important for us to understand that not all distractions that Satan um, and his demons place in our path are painful trials that we must endure, like what David's crying out about here, okay? We need to talk about that. For example, I think uh, the second way the enemy tries to distract us is getting us to pursue many good things in life at the exclusion of the most important things. This is another distraction tactic. As an example, all of us have things in life that we enjoy. God's given us these as blessings. Maybe a nice property, maybe money, possessions, toys. Maybe it's a sport or a hobby or an activity or, or some other sort of passionate pursuit that we throw ourselves into. Um, maybe, it's, um, maybe it's our job. Maybe it's our leisure activities. Maybe, maybe it's even our relationships, hanging out with family and friends. Now, don't get me wrong. None of these things that I've mentioned here in and of themselves are wrong. As a matter of fact, God blesses us with these things. You know, when we, when we see something good, it's a blessing. And we ought to be thankful for it. But we must understand, the master of distractions, he's very sneaky. He's extremely sneaky. He's been doing it for a long time. You know, Solomon, you look at his life, things were going extremely well for him. God blessed him with both wisdom and riches. He was the wisest man that ever lived in human wisdom. That's what the scriptures tell us. He was rich and wise, and he was distracted from wholehearted devotion to God by his pursuit of worldly pleasures. And as a result, his heart became divided where there was this section for God and this section for me. His heart was divided and his love for God waxed cold. And in the end, despite the worldly wisdom that Solomon had more than you and I put together, he was led astray by the idolatry of his many wives. Love for the things of this world above the things of God is a real danger for us who believe, especially in this culture. You know, in other cultures, people are too busy trying to survive to have distractions like we have here. This is why 1 John 2, 15 to 17 warns us, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, emphasis on everything, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So this actually leads us to the understanding that God, who is over us, actually sometimes gives us a blessing when we suffer. You see, suffering can do two things. It's either going to drive us into the arms of our Heavenly Father, or it's going to make us bitter and angry and will drive us further away from Him. It's a great catalyst. And God knows it. You see, He says, Treat hardship, my children, as discipline, for God disciplines those He loves. When we go through hardship, when we suffer, God is with us. He's saying to us, turn your eyes upon me. Don't look to your worldly things to bring you satisfaction and to bring you happiness and to bring you all this peace because that is fleeting. It's moth, the moth and rust doth destroy and thieves break in and steal and circumstances wash it away and you know our youth gets swallowed up in agedness and we get arthritis and crippled and we lose our teeth and our hair falls out and our hair grows white and then we go to the other side, right? Really. God is the God of all eternity. You are his children. You are his ambassadors. 
This world out there that doesn't know Jesus needs to see Jesus in the church. He needs to see Jesus in each and every one of us, living and breathing and acting as Jesus acted. That means not being so concerned about myself, but being concerned about the world that is going to hell in a handbasket. And they avoid the church like a plague because the church has resonated with this idea sometimes, and I'm not saying everyone, but sometimes the church has resonated with this idea that this is our social club and they're not welcome in our social club because they're not good enough. So they're not coming anywhere near us. And they don't want to be near us because they see that we're hypocrites. We spend all our time looking at me, myself, and I. That's not church. Church is the living, breathing body of Christ who gave his own blood to save people from hellfire. There is a world that is going to hell outside of Christ. And as Keith Green sings, we're so asleep in the light sometimes. I'm looking at myself. I'm not just looking out there at the church in general everywhere. I'm looking at myself. I'm saying, God, what is it that you want me to do? And he's, humble yourself. Therefore, under my, my mighty hand, and I will lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon me, for I care for you. If you're going through it, don't get disillusioned. Don't fall into the trap. If you're blessed, don't fall into the trap of pursuing pleasures like Solomon. All these things are, are, are going to lead you to distance from God. God wants you to be red hot for him. He wants you to have a heart after him. And he wants to speak into this community and into this world through you. Yes, me and you, we are the church. And we are better together. We can't do it all alone, right? This is not, I'm not the Lone Ranger. You're not the, you're not Tonto. You're not, whatever. You're not out there alone. We are the body of Christ. God wants us to come back to our first love. What made you decide to follow Jesus? Even if you were raised in a Christian home, was it your mom and dad that, that shared Jesus with you, that, that touched your heart? At one point or another, if you've accepted Jesus, your heart was cut. Your heart was cut by the Holy Spirit. And you realized that you needed God. You needed to be close to him. That's why you came. And that's what he wants to continue with you. When you're a 65-year-plus Christian You've been a Christian for 65 years. Whether you've been a Christian for five years or two years or one year, whatever. God wants your heart. He wants your heart. Let him have it. Just, God, take it. What keeps us from doing it? Disillusionment. Breeding lack of trust. I trust, you know, the American currency, the, little, the old, old penny used to say, in God we trust. In God we trust. I dare say that that slogan has lost its punch. It's more like, in my job I trust. In my wealth I trust. In my health I trust. In my abilities I trust. In me I trust. It's time that the church is separated from that worldly mentality because if we're going to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life, we've got to shine. We've got to take the cover off. And we've got to shine bright because the time is short. Your friend across the street, the person you work with, your relative, they might not have another day. They might come down with terminal illness and be gone like that. You might be going like that and crossing over to the other side. And God's going to say, what have you done with what I've given you? All right? What have you done? I'm not saying that we do things to earn God's favor. No one's saved but by God's grace alone. But goodness, when God's goodness and grace permeate our being, just little people like you and me doing Seemingly little things. But those little things are actually great. And God sees you. So today. Today if you're weary. In Matthew.
Matthew 27, or 11, 27 to 30, Jesus said, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and to those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Son has chosen to reveal the Father to you. You see it? You're the elect of God because he's called you and you've responded to his call. Before the creation of the universe, he called and he purposed that you would be right here, right now. That you heed his call. And Jesus, what did he say to, his, to the, those that, who the Father chose to reveal the Son to? He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know what? You don't need the new Mercedes to have peace. You don't need to have the lakefront property in Tahiti. All you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. Let's pray.